Amen. John chapter 10, turn with me there. As we've been looking at John chapter 10, we have this uh, teaching that John has been giving us. Really, it's the Lord's instruction to us. He's using the motif of the shepherd and the sheep. And we've been looking at the three parables that exist here in John chapter 10. We've covered two of them already. The first one in the first six verses of chapter 10, most assuredly I say to you, he who does not enter by the, she the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper, the Holy Spirit opens, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. And when he brings them out, his own sheep, he goes before them. And the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet the way by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this illustration, this parable, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. That was the religious leadership, those men who were so carnal, so fleshly, couldn't understand the spiritual application. Parable, parable is an earthly story with a, with a heavenly meaning. It's a natural story with a spiritual meaning. And so they couldn't understand the spiritual meaning of this parable, which was that Jesus alone saves. And he calls those whom he's saving by name. If you're here this morning and you are born again, you are a believer and lover of Jesus Christ, obeying his commandments and sharing his truth, then he called you personally by name. And you know that. I remember the summer of 1980 when I was called by name. And I'm so thankful. And I am to this day following my shepherd who has called me out of that public sheepfold and that public sheepfold represented the world, remember? And who opens up the door of your heart? Who opens up the door of your mind to allow the shepherd in? The Holy Spirit. He's the agent through which God works to bring about salvation. It's not that you sought God. God sought you. Previous in chapter 9, we saw that Jesus sought out the blind man who was blind from birth. Had ever a man or a woman been healed who had been blind from birth, but that would be a sign that the Messiah has come because he delivered that man. He opened up the eyes of the blind man and he called him personally by name to come, follow me. Just as he called each one of his own disciples by name, come, follow me. And I asked the question then, are you living your life or are you living his life, the life he has prepared for you? Very important question now, especially at this hour. Time is running out for the world. We need to be more than ever before about our Lord's business. That was the first parable. The public sheepfold. The public sheepfold represented the world. The doorkeeper of that was the Holy Spirit and God was calling us out of the world. Come out from among them by people. Be ye separate and I will be your God and you will be my people. But the next parable he gives us, beginning in chapter seven, uh, chap verse 7 of chapter 10, Jesus said to them again, most assuredly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All whoever came before me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Now, now he's using a different illustration of the sheep and the shepherd. The shepherd has called them out of the world, and now the shepherd is bringing them through the wilderness. And we're going through the wilderness wandering of this world, aren't we? We'll be participating in communion once again the first Wednesday of every month. Why? Because we, as we go through the wandering of this world, we get dirty, don't we? We need a cleansing. In the men's study yesterday, someone mentioned to me, well, I'm just concerned about my children. Maybe they would be deprived of things that they wouldn't be able to experience if the Lord came now. No, God forbid, perish the thought. <laughs> Why would we want our children to walk through the wilderness of this world for one moment longer than they need? No. When God has so much more in mind for them, if he would take them today, wouldn't we pray that our little ones, that they would be born, and before they even went to elementary school, the Lord would take them so they would never, never know a day 
where they willfully have rebelled against them, willfully went in the womb, became damaged, scarred emotionally, spiritually in the soul by the corruption of this world. Wouldn't it be wonderful? Perhaps the seventh will all go as a family. <laughs> yeah. But here, here the parable, the teaching is that, that Jesus is with us, that he's the good shepherd that leads the flock through this wilderness wandering. And he's talking about that, that sheepfold that he would construct in the wilderness, out in the countryside as he's giving them pasture, that that would be the safe place for them to retreat when there was any call that danger was on the horizon. They could retreat into that sheepfold, retreat into the Lord. And we find those safe places that we have in this world now, don't we? One of them should be your home. As soon as you cross the threshold of your home, it should be a oh, safe home. How many today around the world would wish that we would rescue them and bring them home? I remember being in India for three weeks and not being able to get a flight out because my one flight from India to Germany wasn't reserved. And I called the fellow working on my arrangements. I get me out. one way or another, get me out of here. I didn't want to be stuck in Mumbai. And I couldn't wait to get home. And I was so thankful to be home. I remember traveling through Eritrea and Ethiopia there was a war going on between the two nations, and it wasn't safe at all. And one of the Ethiopians said, why are you here? It's not safe for you here. Well, I don't know why I'm here, Lord. Get me out of <laughs> here. <laughs> oh, but what a wonderful feeling it was when we touched down in the United States. Oh. Don't you feel that way sometimes when you come to church? Safe place. Home. Oh. That sheepfold that's constructed in the wilderness, that ark of salvation, that safe place is Jesus, the shepherd of our souls. Now, when, when things get difficult, and you, you ever get depressed? You ever suffer depression, emotional distress? Come on, you know, we just look without and become distressed. Look within, become depressed. Look to Jesus, find my rest. <sighs> that safe place, that sheepfold. And the sheep who would enter into that sheepfold have to go by way of going over the shepherd. One door in, one door out. Speaking of salvation now. First parable, first teaching coming out of the world. The next one now, you're his flock. You're his sheep. You belong to the shepherd. And there's only one way to get into the sheepfold that's in the wilderness, that safe place that here is in this world, and it's through the person of Jesus Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me, in me, through me. Is that true or not? Either it's true, and Jesus is absolutely certain that he alone is the way, the exclusivity of Jesus Christ in Christianity, or he's a liar. I'm banking on the fact that he's true. only way. And now we come to this third parable, this third teaching that the Lord gives us with regard to the relationship between the shepherd and his sheep. Called us out of the world, made us his own. And he is with us in every suffering we will ever go through. And sometimes he's with us silently, but with us nonetheless. His compassion, his heart, his love, his person, his presence is there. When someone is suffering, the, the, the greatest act of compassion, of empathy, of kindness that you can give is just the ministry of what? Presence. Just, just don't say a word, just your presence. Not to say a word. One of the most difficult times of my life darkest periods of my life. There was a good friend. I moved out of my home and he wasn't far from where I, he could see my light from his house. Many sleepless nights. At two o'clock in the morning, he would knock on my door and just come in and not say anything. Just sit. The ministry of presence. It was the Lord comforting me through that man. 
make a cup of tea and just sit, not say a word, and just let me talk when I was ready to talk. Let me speak when I was ready to speak. And so often, that's what the Lord, when the Lord is silent, he's just allowing us to express our heart our raw emotions at the time. And whatever they may be, it's legitimate for you to express them, but at the end of the day, he's going to heal us. It's the process by which we go through where he brings about that beautiful healing that we all need, isn't it? Isn't it? And that he alone, he alone is the shepherd of the sheep who is going to tell us he alone has given his life When John uses the word life here in chapter 10, it's the word that Jesus used, which is suke. He gave his soul, suke, to save your soul, suke. Oh, the shepherd not only called us out of the world, he's not only with us in this world now as we go through the tribulations, the sorrows, and the sufferings, but he's the one who made absolute assurance that he would exchange his soul for ours. Ours for his. Isn't that wonderful? Look with me. Chapter 10, verse 11. I am the good shepherd, and the, sh- the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. This is one of four times now in this chapter he's going to talk about surrendering his life. He gives his life. No one will ever take his life. You can't kill the Lord. You can't commit deicide, although they attempted, and the devil thought he won. You can't kill God. <laughs> No, but he laid down his life, his substitutionary life in this flesh, in his incarnation, so that we would be saved. Yes, I'm the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. But a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. Yeah. You know, you're in the midst of a wolf or a wolfette when sheep start to go missing in the congregation or in the fold, right? I've seen that happen more than once in my time here. We're a wolf or a wolfette will come in, and pretty soon I find sheep missing. And in no time at all, I find out they have been devoured by some heretical doctrine, some nonsense, some lie of the devil. The devil is a liar from the beginning and a murderer. And what does he desire? He desires to steal the sheep. And what is his purpose for stealing the sheep? To kill them, to destroy them. The only satisfaction the devil gets is stealing away from those who are so precious to God because it so hurts the heart of God. Nothing can hurt me more than if my my children are suffering, if my son is suffering. Nothing can bring me more pain. I would rather take that suffering upon myself than see those that I love suffer. And the enemy knows the only way he can hurt God, hurt the heart of God, is by stealing away those that are precious to him. God is not willing that any, any, remember that, every single person you ever come across, Jesus died for that one, for that one, precious to him. And it breaks his heart far more than it ever would ours when someone is lost. Stolen away by a hireling, by a wolf, by the devil. But the hireling does not own the sheep. He doesn't care. And danger comes. What would come? What kind of a danger would come as the shepherd is allowing his sheep to graze in the wilderness of Israel? Lions? Bears? Wolves? Thieves? Jackals? Hyenas? Foxes. There's all kinds of dangerous beasts out there. In Psalm 22, the psalmist is going to liken those who are causing the great suffering to the Savior as beasts, animals. Zoanthropy, right? What is zoanthropy? When a man acts like an animal, thinks he's an animal. That's precisely how he describes them in the psalm. He talks about dogs. Bulls goring him, lions devouring. Well, that would be a genuine concern for the shepherd as he's out in the wilderness because there were a lot of wild beasts, but, but more concerning than the four-legged beasts were the two-legged who would conspire together and come and kill the shepherd and try to steal away the flock. 
how many two-legged beasts we have walking around today trying to destroy the reputation of the shepherd and stealing away his flock. It's amazing to me when, when in this day and time we can so accurately interpret the scriptures. When we use the principles of hermeneutics in our application of interpretation in the scripture, you, every, every, listen to me, every single biblical text has how many technical interpretations? One. How many people are completely unaware of that truth? They say, well, it was written by men and other men interpreted it however they so choose or however they please, and so anybody can come away with any interpretation they want. Nay, no, nonsense. When you use the proper principles of interpretation, keeping the context king, okay, using the, the understanding of the grammatical nuances in the Hebrew and the Aramaic and the Greek and, and the historical background, you can only, listen, you can only come away with one technical interpretation to every single biblical text. Is that true? Well, how do we have such distortion, such mutilation of the Word of God today? Wolves. Wolves mishandling the word of God, doing violence to the word of God. Why? Why? One purpose. And even if they don't know that, they're being used by the chief conspirator, that liar from the beginning, that murderer, they're being used by him to beguile and steal away the sheep. Be careful, beloved. It is amazing, astounding to me, the massive ignorance in the church today with regard to the word of God when, like never before, we have the ability to interpret the scripture, to know clearly what it says. I hope, I know, I love this congregation because you're such serious students of the word of God. You come with the Bible in your lap. But more importantly, you've already come with it in your head and your heart. But not, not too many out there. That's why the sheep are beguiled. So quickly confused. Oh, when danger comes, the hirelings run. How would we make application to that truth today? Look at the number of men and women, national platforms, caving into the wokeness of today. The doctrines of wolves, of devils, of demons. And they're capitulating, leaving the flock for the sake of notoriety, fame, success, measured by nickels and noses. That's not success. Success, in, success as a Christian is the same as success in ministry, simply being obedient to what God has told us, declaring what God has said. I have no business misrepresenting him or his word. And when I do, I run the danger of being a hireling, not caring for the flock. Verse 13, the hireling flees because he is a hireling and he does not care about the sheep. Be very careful of those who have a national platform, but they don't shepherd a flock. Now, there's only one shepherd, right? There's only one flock, one faith, one baptism, one Lord, Ephesians 4, right? And, and a lot of us are under shepherds. I'm not, I don't consider myself an under shepherd. Every good shepherd needs one or more sheepdogs, and that's what I am. I'm a sheepdog, you know. <laughs> but we have a responsibility to properly represent the shepherd, right? Here he's saying that The hireling doesn't care about the sheep. He only cares about his success, himself. How many go from church to church just trying to build their own reputation, their own little kingdom? Who's the richest evangelist in the world today? Kenneth Copeland. How much does he have? A billion dollars. Almost a billion dollars. 800 million or more? He owns the ministry. People don't own the ministry. A small example of that is when you go to a church, if you decide to leave this one and go somewhere else, which 
most often happens every two years for most Christians. You know, the average Christian spends two years in a given church. So they move from church to church. You want to find out who owns the church. Because in our contemporary age, most of the hirelings own the church building and all the property and all the assets. The church doesn't own the church. Did you know that? The lawsuit that's going on with the biggest church in Greenville County? What church is that? What is it? Relentless, whatever it might be, I don't know. Who owns that church? Who owns that building? Who owns that property? The apostles. There's a problem in that, isn't there? Hmm. Hirelings. Hirelings. Who owns the church? God does. Jesus does. Now, when, when a community comes together to form a place of worship, to gather together, to uh, share all those one another commands that are given in the scriptures, it's the church's property, not any individual. Hmm. Just point of context there. Verse 14, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and I am known by them. That speaks of an intimacy of relationship where you really know one another. You know, so, some of you I've known for a long time. Well, over 20 years, almost three decades. And I know you. And when you walk through the door and I look at your face, I know right away whether you're having a good day or a bad day. I can tell by the inflection in your voice whether something's wrong or not. Just as the sheep dog, I know the sheep. <laughs> Oh, but how much, more, how, much, how much more the shepherd of the flock? He knows you better than you know yourself, doesn't he? Yeah. You, you don't have to tell him what you're in need of. He knows before you even ask. He knows you so intimately. And for some of you, this could be problematic, not for me so much anymore, but he knows the number of on your head. Wow. I don't think there's a mother here that knows the number of hairs on her child's head. But Jesus knows every single hair upon your head. Precious are you. He knows every thought, every concern. He knows every tear you have ever shed. The intimacy of relationship between the shepherd and his sheep. And the sheep know their shepherd and they know when it's not their shepherd. They know when he's being misrepresented. They know when it's not the Lord. Immediately. A, a warning sign goes off inside, and you know that this, this, this doesn't sound like my shepherd. This doesn't sound at all like the Jesus that I know. You've been there before. You've been in those situations. So we're talking about an intimacy of relationship where you know when Jesus is being misrepresented. You know when his word is being distorted and twisted. Yes, there is an intimacy of relationship where you love your shepherd and the shepherd loves you and you want to make him known to all. Verse 15, as the father knows me, even so I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. Second time he tells us that now. He's not only the shepherd that calls his sheep out by name. He's not only the shepherd that's with them in their wilderness wanderings, you know, as we go through this world, but he's the one who's laid down his life for you. He will do everything for your eternal security, for your eternal good. He's not concerned about your temporal happiness, is he? No, I've heard someone say to me once, you know, well, if it matters to me, it should matter to God. Really? <laughs> I think it's the other way around, my dear. If it matters to God, it better matter to you, right? Yeah. But he's the shepherd who takes such great care of us who has assured our salvation. He has a saving grace. He has a keeping grace. And oh, one day, maybe soon, that glorifying grace. Amen? You don't keep yourself, do you? No, no, no. The shepherd, the shepherd keeps his sheep from wandering away. Now, there are times when he has to take some action that maybe the sheep don't like. When he has a rebellious one that's wandering away, he's got that, he's got his staff, Right? But he also has a short piece of wood that's got a root or gnarled end, heavy, and he can throw that. And when the sheep starts going in the wrong direction, he doesn't have, unfortunately, the good boy collar that I use for my dog. You know. <laughs> he throws that and it hits the sheep. Whoop. He calls him back. Now, if he doesn't respond to that, then what does the shepherd do? 
he breaks their leg for, for fear that they would cause others within the flock to wander away into harm's way. A sheep can, will never survive without the shepherd's care. Do you understand that? Will you survive this world without his care? No, never. You will be destroyed. The flesh's ultimate... Please understand this about the flesh. You give your flesh its way in any area of the lust of the flesh and what will ultimately result? Destruction. Death. The flesh's ultimate desire is its own self-destruction. Isn't that amazing? Yet the way we pamper the flesh and parade the flesh and hold it so precious and dear, yet yet its ultimate purpose, if given its way completely, would be our own self-destruction. Wow. Oh, but the shepherd keeps us. Not only has the shepherd taken responsibility for calling us out, but he has taken responsibility for keeping us safe in that wilderness with all these beasts that are out there and the beast that is within. (laughs) Do you understand that about yourself? That Jesus... In his keeping grace, keeps you even from yourself. And then that saving grace that ultimately will bring us to glory. Yes. And then he goes on to say in verse 16, Now other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring and they will hear my voice. And there will be one flock and one shepherd. Now what's he talking about there? The Gentiles, the Goyim. The predominantly within the church, the early church, it was predominantly Jewish. All of the writers of the Bible, except for one, were Jewish, right? It's a Jewish Messiah. It's a Jewish wedding we're going to have. We're a Jewish bride. You understand the Jewishness or the Israelology of the Bible. If you don't understand that, you're missing so much of its meaning. And we try to place emphasis upon that. I think we neglected to play for, pray for Israel this morning, didn't we? Lord, we want to lift up the Taiwanese right now because they're, they're, they're deathly afraid that China's going to come in and use the weakness in this present administration to take over Taiwan without firing a shot. And Lord, equally, equally, our Israeli brothers and sisters are afraid because they do not sense that they can be confident of the United States' guarantees of protection and security. And now the enemies of Israel are emboldened. They're gathering together. And we see it intensifying. Rockets were fired yesterday. Hezbollah, Hamas, nothing more than proxies for Iran. Iran, nothing more than a proxy for Russia. And we realize that the Gog Magog invasion of Israel, you read it later on this afternoon, Ezekiel, chapter 38 and 39 are about to come upon us. Chapter 37, that valley of dry bones, right? Where all of Israel comes back together in the land where a nation is reborn in a day. I mean, just miraculously, after 2,000 years of being dispersed among the nations of the world again, they've been gathered in there. Ezekiel describes for us in that portion of the text how, how the nation, uh, the people, uh, the, excuse me, the land has been revived. And then he brings the people back into the land. And then he's going to restore the people back into himself spiritually. Well, Ezekiel... Um, Ezekiel 37, who was it that quoted that in September 2010 at Auschwitz? Benjamin Netanyahu said, in my hearing, this scripture has been fulfilled in this day. Wow. If 37 was fulfilled, that means 38 and 39 are right around the corner, aren't they? If you know what I'm talking about, the Gog Magog invasion, where Russia, Iran, Turkey, and some other Arab nations come together to destroy Israel. And that's yet future. And it'd be, we make wake up tomorrow morning and find out because of the weakness. Of, weak leaders always produce difficult times, dangerous times. There's a cycle that goes on. Weak leaders produce difficult times. Difficult times produce strong leaders. Strong leaders produce good times. Good times produce... Consider England in World War II. Who was the strong leader of England in World War II? Churchill. He led them to victory. He was a rock. His faith in God. His dedication to the people. The war was over. V-Day. They won. And what did the English people do with Churchill? Threw him out of office. Weak leadership. Let's pray. Let's pray that the Lord gives us a little more time 
and the weak leadership that's being expressed now and the danger that, that it's putting the world into, not just the United States, will produce some strong leaders now. Will result in some good times. Hmm? Other sheep. So he not only has a flock of Israel, and he's come for the lost sheep of Israel, hasn't he? Jesus first came, he came for Israel specifically. But Israel forsook the Messiah nationally. Now, the early church was predominantly Jewish, but a very small percentage. Just like in Haiti, you mentioned Haiti and the darkness that's there, the Santeria, the, the witchcraft, the occult, the blend of, of, of this, this occultism and, and Catholicism. Only 5 to 6% of the Haitian people are evangelical. Very small percentage. Very small percentage of the Jews during Jesus' time believed in Jesus as their Messiah. There was the national rejection of the Messiah, and therefore the gospel went west. Go west, young man, go west. Isn't that what they told Paul? <laughs> and they opened up the gospel west to the Goyam, to the Gentile world. What a disaster, what a mistake. Was it? By the predetermined counsel and foreknowledge of God the Father, he determined the rejection of the Messiah by the nation. Why? For the other flock. Other sheep. The Gentile. Romans tells us that. Read Romans 9, 10, and 11. The same thing is true as Jesus is talking about laying down his life over and over again. Look at this now. Verse 15, he says, as the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice. And there will be one flock and one shepherd. Make no mistake of that. It's unfortunate that in the history of the church, there hasn't been that understanding of the place of Israel, the place of prominence of the nation, the people of Israel, the Jewish people, being chosen of God to represent his grace and his love to the world. The lack of understanding of the Israelology or the Jewishness of the faith that we have. I love it when somebody tells me, why would you invite me to my church? I'm Jewish. <laughs> what an open door that is. <laughs> Verse 17, therefore my father loves me. Loves the shepherd. Why? Because I laid down my life that I may take it up again. What's he talking about there? The resurrection. No one takes his life. He lays it down. No one takes it from me. Verse 18. But I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it again. This commandment I have received from my father. He came the first time as the lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. He's coming the next time as the lion of the tribe of Judah, to conquer over his enemies, displace those who don't belong here, are not subject to his rule, not surrendered to his love and his authority, and establish his kingdom. Hmm. That's the revelation. That's what that's all about there. Did Jesus predetermine that he would die? Yes, of course. It's throughout the Old Testament and it's throughout the New Testament that Jesus, that the... When was the church birthed? Pentecost. When was that? 50 days after the resurrection. When was that in the Bible? Acts chapter 2. Turn with me there. The birth of the church. Acts chapter 2. The church was birthed on Pentecost, when Pentecost had fully come, right? If you understand the major feasts of Israel, the seven major feasts of Israel, the first four had been fulfilled on their very day by Christ. If you're new to our chapel family or new to understanding of the Israelology of the Bible, you need to understand the seven feasts of Israel, and you'll have no, under, no problem understanding eschatology or God's timetable for the end of time, the end of the age. Also, Daniel chapter 9, you have, you have a good understanding, good grasp of Daniel chapter 9 in particular, you'll have no problem interpreting Bible prophecy. But 
Suffice it to say for our conversation, those seven major feasts given to us in Leviticus 23 by God all represent his timetable, his appointments in the future yet. And that's what they're referred to as. Not only do they commemorate or memorialize something God did in the past on behalf of his people Israel through Moses, every one, every single one of them of the seven are anticipatory of something God is going to do through the person of his son, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. He fulfilled the first for on the very day. Wow. Such a coincidence. Rabbi says, coincidence is not a kosher word. God is sovereign, right? <laughs> so here, Acts chapter 2, it says, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, or when it was fulfilled, who wrote Acts? Same guy that wrote the Gospel of Luke. What was his name? Luke. <laughs> he was a Gentile. The only, the only Gentile writer of the Bible, Okay. But here, Luke records for us when the church was birthed on the day of Pentecost. Uh, the, one of the, the celebrations during the feast, there were two loaves that were offered unto God on Pentecost. Two loaves of bread, two loaf offerings. But both of them, highly unusual, very suspect. Why? Because they have something that no other grain offering would ever have. Leaven. Two loaves offering to God with leaven. What does leaven represent? Sin. Why Sin. It corrupts by puffing up. Isn't that what pride does? Look at the prideful leaders we have today and how corrupt they are and so filled with pride. Oh, my. But those two loaves, two loaves leavened with sin. Jew and Gentile. One church, one faith, one Lord, one baptism. First sermon ever preached by Peter after the church was birthed. Look at this, chapter 2. Go to verse... Peter's sermon begins in verse 14. Chapter 2, verse 22. Go there. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which he did through him in your midst as you yourselves also know. Hey, hey, one of the evidences that he was the Messiah was the very works that he performed, right? Remember all of those those witnesses that we talked about previously in John's gospel, witness of the scriptures, witness of Moses, witness of Abraham, witness of the works, witness of the Holy Spirit, witness of John the Baptist, etc., etc., etc. So that's all that Peter's affirming here. Those miracles that he performed bore witness. They screamed out, this is the Messiah. Him, verse 23 in particular, to our conversation, him being determined by being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. What? God the Father predetermined that his son would be taken and brutalized, scourged, scorned, mocked, crucified? Yes. Yes. I'm the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. By the foreknowledge of God, pre, God predetermined, not just the sacrifice of Israel, you know, in, in a crazy way, not, not in a saving way, not, not in a complete way. Please don't misunderstand what I'm going to say right now. But Israel was also referred to as the son of God in the Bible. His children, Israel, his sons, Israel. Israel was sacrificed for your salvation. The, by the predetermined counsel of God, Israel rejected their own Messiah. Had, had all of Israel accepted that Jesus was the Messiah, what would have happened? The kingdom would have been established, all the Jews would have entered in, and you're out. There would have been no salvation for the Gentile. But God purposed the natural, national rejection of the Messiah by the Jew for the salvation of the Gentile, sacrificing not just his son Jesus, but initially his son Israel. Wow. But make no mistake... He hasn't forsaken Israel, has he? Oh, no. Does he have a future plan for Israel? Oh, yeah. Two prominent themes of Scripture, the Christ, the Messiah, and Israel. Israel. The only nation, the only nation in the entire world that receives a favored nation status in the eyes of God. They will exist, as Billy Graham says, forever and ever and ever. <laughs> but here he says, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands and crucified and put him to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was impossible, not possible that he should be held by it. 
And then he goes on and quotes Psalm 16, where, where David, again, under the spirit of prophecy, is indicating that the Messiah, the Savior of the world, when he was crucified, died and buried, he descended into Hades. But his soul would not be left in Hades. And that's what we say in the creed, don't we? Look at the text. Where is it? Where is it? Um, verse 27 for you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. He was there for three days and three nights. In Hades, what's Hades? Mankind's common grave, and there were two places there in Hades, just for those who may not understand. Hades is just a common burial place for all of mankind, unbelieving dead and the believing dead. Those who believe the promise of God in the Old Testament that would be fulfilled in the person of the Messiah, they went into this place called Abraham's bosom or paradise. Jesus references both. He references Abraham's bosom when he talks about the rich man and the beggar Lazarus. It wasn't a parable. It was an actual event that took place. This rich man had no compassion, no regard on, on Lazarus, the beggar who had beggared the crumbs that would fall from his table. Oh, but they both died. And the rich man and the beggar, they both went to Hades. But the rich man went to that place of the unbelieving dead where he was being tormented. And Lazarus, the place of Abraham's bosom being comforted by your father Abraham, being assured that all of the promises that God had made of the Messiah would be fulfilled soon. Mankind's common grave, otherwise called paradise. And when did Jesus call it paradise? On the cross. When that thief was given the grace gift of faith to believe. For by grace you have been, listen to me now, no one chooses God. God chooses you. For by grace, charismata, grace, gift of faith, you believe, right? For by grace, you've been saved through faith, that not of your own, but a gift of God, none of works, least any man should boast. You have to receive a grace gift of faith to believe. God gives you the grace to put in your heart a believing faith. And therefore, he saves you. Who does it? Author and finisher. Beginning and end, sustainer. It's all, it's all Christ, isn't it? Yeah. And so he gave that thief upon the cross a grace gift of faith to believe. And he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he looked over at him and he said, this day, my son, you will be with me in paradise. Now, he wasn't talking about heaven. He didn't go to heaven yet, did he? No, that day he went to Hades. He went to, pray. He went to that place that was reserved for the righteous dead, the believing dead place of comfort. Now, does that place exist anymore? No. Why? Because Jesus ascended. Remember, he rose from the dead three days later. Forty days he was seen on earth, and then he led the captives free. He took all those who believed in him with him to heaven. No one could go to heaven until Jesus went first. And now that place is empty, but the place of torment, the place for the unbelieving dead, it still exists. Everyone who dies outside their faith goes to Hades temporarily. It's just a temporary holding pen until when? The great white throne judgment. Not the Bema seat. It's totally different. This is the great white throne judgment. It is destined for men once to die. And then the judgment. The, listen, the only time of decision is now. You won't have that opportunity when you die. I had a confrontation with a man that I discussed this with who believed you had opportunity for salvation after death. Nonsense. There's no opportunity for, for men once they die. There's no opportunity for demons, for salvation. Now is the time. Today is the day of decision. Maybe that's for you today or for you that I'm talking to over the Internet. John chapter 10. Oh, my goodness. Where did the morning go? <laughs> Verse 19, therefore, there was a division among them. This is the third time there's a division among them with regard. Some believed, some didn't believe. Some received that grace gift of faith, others did not. But in chapter 7, verse, 40, chapter 7, verse 43, it says they had a division. Chapter 9, verse 16, they had a division. 1 Corinthians eleven nineteen 19 says divisions must come. Paul wrote that. He hates that. Nobody likes divisions. You like divisions in the family? You like divisions in your church? You like divisions in your relationships? You like divisions in our country? Have we ever been more divided? But Jesus 
says through the Apostle Paul, they must come. Why? Show those who are approved. Those who got it right. Now, it's amazing how twisted things are today, aren't they? How they can take the truth and so twist it. How good is perceived to be evil and evil is perceived to be good. And, and government is so upside down. The establishment of government was to promote good and punish evil. We have a government that promotes evil and punishes good. We have a federal government that's a criminal organization. The criminality that the federal government has committed is beyond my imagination. I would never believe in my lifetime I would see our government and our country so corrupt. Many of them said, he has a demon. He's mad. Why do you listen to him? Others said, these are not the words of one who has a demon. Can a demon open up the eyes of the blind? That would have been a messianic sign to give sight to the blind. Yes, there were those who received the grace gift of faith to believe. And they profess that belief, as we should today. Don't be intimidated. Don't be in fear. Don't let anybody tell you you have to keep your belief in the box of your church. No, no, no. Go ye therefore. Right? I thought we'd get into Psalm 22 today. <laughs> it's the Lord's service, isn't it? You know, we, we don't choreograph our services. They're not planned to the T. But next week, next week, we will finish this by looking at Psalm 22, the Psalm of the Cross. And then we'll go into a few more verses in the John 10, and maybe we'll get to uh, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. And then the following week, we'll finish chapter 10 and go to Psalm 24, the shepherd and his crown, the Melech Kabad, who is this king of glory. Hmm? But that's well worth your time, reading through chapter 10, the entire chapter, and to go back and study those three shepherd psalms in the Old Testament, 22, 23, 24. 22, the shepherd and his cross. 23, the shepherd and his crook, his staff. 24, the shepherd and his crown. Mm. Prophet, priest, and king. That's who Jesus is. That's those three roles. Amen? Oh, so much more for us to learn together, eh? Yeah, so much more for us to share out there in the wilderness. And when you need to run to the sheepfold, you just run. You know where the door is. You know that safe place. Don't let anybody confuse you, and don't let anybody put you in fear. Great, chief, glorious, grand is our shepherd. Amen? You got a closing song for us, Nathan? Shall we stand?